Good morning. Good morning. I have determined. So let me ask you a question first. Who's looking forward to the new year? Put your hand up. Wow. Who is not looking forward to the new year? Put my hand up. Okay, there are two kinds of people in this world. And we just let you know which one you are. You know, those of you that are excited about 2019, those of us that are just getting used to 2018. Okay? Um, this is the end of our year. Wanted to... Uh, I'm going to give you guys a chance to share what God has done for you, to you, and through you throughout 2018. Throughout Scripture, we see God tells the people to remember these things, to talk about them with their children that they wouldn't be forgotten. I think sometimes we get so caught up in what's going on in the moment that we forget how faithful He has been throughout our walk with Him. Um, I want to give you a couple things before we get to that point. So you guys be gesticulating in your heads. Let it, let it kind of percolate in there what God has done for you in 2018. And I want to share a couple of things with you. Um, if you have your Bible, open to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So the author, who most believe is, is Solomon, uh, this, this book stands in marked contrast to a lot of the Proverbs and to the book of uh, the Song of Songs. Um, I, I think this book was probably written towards the end of Solomon's life. And, uh, you know, Solomon had a lot going for him. Uh, and he, he uh, pretty well messed it up. Um, as a matter of fact, right across from the city of David, you have uh, the Mount of Olives, and then just to the side of that, you have the Mount of Offense, where Solomon set up all the, the temples and altars for his wives to other gods. Uh, and I, I think about that because looking straight across from the city of David, you don't look to the Mount of Olives, you look to the Mount of Offense. Uh, so the author writes, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now, I don't know what Solomon's mindset was when he wrote this. I don't really care. Because... The Holy Spirit inspired this to speak to us. And as we wrap up 2018 and we move into 2019, um, I want us to 
really focus on a couple of key things in 2019. In 2019, I'm going to have uh, memory verses for us to learn as a church. Okay? Not going to be a whole lot of them, but you know, we get one or two memory verses each month. Over the course of a couple years, we've got quite a few verses. So if you want to get a jump on next week's verse, Psalm 119.11. Would somebody quote that for me? Oh, that's why it's a memory verse, because you haven't memorized it yet. Well, yeah, but they'll come up when you need them. Depending on the translation you have, uh, it will say, I have stored or I have hidden, um, I have concealed your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, well, really, that's the whole purpose of Psalm 119, knowing the word. Okay, so that, that's, that's one thing that I really want us to focus on, to get the word knit into our souls. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want us to focus on, I just read this, A Time for Everything, and, and it seems to kind of work in equity. Um, that's life. You know? Um, sometimes life stinks. Life is a bummer. Sometimes life is fantastic. But I want to share with you something that I, I really want us to focus and point on, um, if you have your bulletin, go ahead and look at the front of it. This is from Philippians chapter 4. And this is the, uh, Paul is kind of wrapping up his thoughts to the church at Philippi. And down in verse 4, he begins this thing that I really want us to get into our minds. <clears throat> Rejoice in the Lord when everything is going your way. Rejoice in the Lord when things are not as bad as they could be. Oftentimes, God speaks to us in absolutes. That's how we know that there is an absolute truth. Paul, writing under the inspiration, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So, what is a good time to rejoice? <laughs> the moment that you're in. Then he goes on and he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And, this thought is being joined to the last one, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice this thing, these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, oftentimes we stop there, but Paul didn't stop there. You know, he, he didn't have the, the little subtopic uh, to divide up his thought. So going right into verse 10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have renewed or revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. 
in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, a couple things that I want to draw out here for you. He says, whatever is worthy, think about these things. Uh, it says in verse uh, 8, in anything worthy of praise. You know, all too often, we get myopic. We, we, we tend to see what's right in front of our faces. And we, we really don't take the big view. Uh, we get caught up in our own life, in our own struggles, our own troubles. And, and a lot of times, we try to face them on our own, in our own strength, and uh, with, with varying degrees of success. Um, I believe what, what Paul is laying out for us here is not the exception, but this should be the norm. I think we need to take control of our thoughts. Okay? Uh, I think we don't let the enemy come in and start sowing uh, distracting and corrupted things. I think we take control of them. And I think Paul is laying out for us what should be the norm for Christian life. Uh, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. By the way, if you didn't get it, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. When I was young, uh, I, I told some of you, I may have told all of you, I had hearing problems. Um, they, they said it was like something like 60 to 90 percent hearing loss. And they did a bunch of tests, and I, I don't remember a whole lot other than sitting with earphones that were bigger than my head and having to raise my hand and, and you know. Um, they determined that my ears were fine, thank you very much. The problem was with my brain, which a lot of you probably know. Um, I had to do things uh, to, to correct. Between my ear and my brain, the signal was getting scrambled. And so my parents had to do what was called sequencing. Okay, So they would call me out to them, and they'd say, OK, Glenn, I want you to go to the bathroom and come here. Go, go to the bathroom, and then come right back here. So I'd go to the bathroom turn around and come back and they say, okay, now I want you to go to the bathroom and get your toothbrush and bring it here. And so I would go to the bathroom and grab, hopefully, my toothbrush and bring it back to them. Uh, and, and they would continue to add on and add on and basically retraining my brain to look at each thing as it came in so I could grab onto it. Um, one of the things that I want you to understand about that is we memorize most often through repetition, okay? Repeating things, okay? We say a memory verse over and over and over again. We play that memory verse on our iPod or your phone or your television or whatever over and over and over again. Uh, years ago, uh, Christy and I were in a church that uh, was not a very good situation for us. Uh, the church used to periodically, maybe once or twice a year, they would have uh, Bible trivia. And they would pick um, a book, and then we would do a, a trivia contest, the men versus the women. And we had, uh, they had chosen the book of James. And we had kind of come under fire for some of the things that we had stood for. And Christy and I, in you know, the maturity of a, a Christian believer, uh, decided we were going to show them. So we memorized the entire book of James. Mm -hmm. And um, when the time for the competition came, it ended up being a draw because Christy and I knew all the answers. <laughs> um, I don't say that to float my boat. I did it for absolutely wrong reasons. My, my motivation was not to get the Word of God knitted into my soul. My motivation was to show them. Okay. 
But a lot of the book of James is still with me. Okay? Um, we have to repeat these things over and over. When, when God repeats something, especially in the same verse, the same thought, we really need to pay attention. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. <clears throat> I think it's the opposite of your hard-headedness, your stiff-neckedness. Is that a word? <laughs> stiff, it is now. Stiff-neckedness. Um, don't be anxious about anything. You know, I, I started um, with Ecclesiastes, a time for everything, and I was looking back on the year, and, and I have a, a, I actually have a sheet that Christy typed up to me. My wife is so wonderful. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but there are a couple things that I want to point out to you. The very first thing, uh, a time for everything that Solomon writes is what? A time to be born and a time to die. And 2018, uh, we, we had the birth of Phineas, who evidently stayed home today. Where is he? Is he sleeping? Okay. He's asleep? Oh, then I won't pick him up. And we had the home going of one of the founding deacons of Jesus Community Church. And, and those two things stand in marked contrast. Okay. Ted got to go home, and even now... Ted is experiencing life like he never did on this earth. Okay. Um, the, you know, Scripture says that we don't grieve as the world does or, or those without hope. But we still miss them. Yeah. You know? That doesn't mean that we don't grieve. Um, you know, when uh, Christy and I were, were working, uh, there were a lot of times that I would have to take trips. Well, not a lot of times, but several times I had to take trips and she wasn't able to come with me, and I, I missed her very much. Um, matter of fact, getting off of the plane and coming down, and, and uh, my wife and my children are there, I got a lump in my throat because I missed them. Um, <coughs> we don't grieve as those who have no hope because we have hope. A certain and a sure hope. That one day, not too distant in the future, we will be reunited with our loved ones. Okay? And the flawed, imperfect relationship that we had in this life will be made perfect. And there will be no more crying, no tears, no death, no sickness. Everything will work the way that it was intended. Okay? Um, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, now see, this is, this is how you combat, combat the anxiousness. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay? So, we have anxiety, we have situation and circumstance that causes us to be anxious. And there's a lot in this life that can cause anxiety. One of the things that I have been dealing with over the course of the last few months, uh, actually it's been a couple years now, is periodically, I didn't even realize it until about two or three weeks ago, I was having panic attacks, always in relation to my diabetes. Um, because there were, there were several episodes in a row where I had a, a very low blood sugar, and I went and I got something, and I waited for a little bit, because they almost always happen in the middle of the night, and I waited for a little bit, and then I checked my sugar again. And, and on two occasions, my sugar was actually lower after having eaten than it was before I ate. And I would get this panic because I, I've gone unconscious twice that were really significant. Um, I don't like it. Okay? Um, it is a, a bizarre thing to go to sleep in your bed 
and wake up at the table and you're sticky with jelly, you're sitting in your skivvies and there's two women that you do not know are asking you if you're okay. I don't really know because I don't know how I got here, I don't know who you are, and I have no idea what's going on. I don't like it, okay? And then I would get these, these things where it's like, I, I gotta get my sugar up, I gotta get my sugar up, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go out. Um, and then it was just probably, what was it, Christy, about three weeks ago, two weeks ago? I, it, God just kindly showed me that you're having a panic attack. You're, you're not focusing on what is happening, you're focused on what you are afraid of might happen. And there have been a couple times where my sugar has gotten low and I can feel it start. And I have to go back to what this says and with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, I lay it to God. Okay? And, and that's awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a perfect formula for us to use, but, but it doesn't stop there. Okay? Because God posits the problem, he provides us with the equation to address the problem, but he also gives us what the equation works out to be. Because if you look in the next verse, in verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that you can't figure out, that I can't figure out. There have been times um, in my life where I have had a peace where I should not have had any peace. Okay. My hope is to get to the point where this is consistently how I live my life. Um, and then verse 8, he uh, goes through what we are to put in our brains. Now, our brains move along certain paths. We all have our ruts. We all have those areas that we, we have dwelt in our whole life. And, and what we need to do is train ourselves to get out of those ruts and start creating a new rut whereby we think of the things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, and that's what we dwell on. That's where we let our brain rest. Now, I'm just going to hit one more thing because I really want to uh, give you guys an opportunity to share with us. Um, Paul, uh, in verse 11, he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. <coughs> I think that is one of the greatest keys to peace in the Christian life. Yeah. Being content with what you have. Whether you have little or whether you have much, be content with it. That's not the American way. No, that's not what we're taught in our culture. Our culture is you need the newer model, the bigger model. You need the, the, the whatever particular thing happens to be out there at the moment, and you're not going to be happy until you get it. You know, there used to be the, uh, years ago when I was young, there was the commercial for Mountain Dew. I, I'm looking at you, Nathan. One of the times that I actually look at somebody, I'm looking at Nathan because he loves Mountain Dew. Okay. Um, and they used to have this song, Give Me a, a Mountain with Nothing to Do. Give Me a Mountain, Give Me Mountain Dew. And there were always these people, these well-built men and women, frolicking on the side of the mountain, in the water, running around, and if you drink Mountain Dew, you can join us. I drank Mountain Dew for years, and it never, <laughs> never. Mostly what I got was other teenage boys that were sweaty and stinky and played ping pong. <laughs> That's what I got, okay? Um, let me know if it changes for you, Nathan, <laughs> okay? Um, being content. And then he goes on and he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. So what circumstance is excluded here? Nothing. So in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What is that? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
everything. Now, I just want to just give you a taste of some of the ups and downs that uh, Paul had. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, This is part of Paul's defense of his apostleship. And it's actually a very sad event that he needed to write this. Um, this is his follow-up letter to the Corinthians. I'm going to pick up in verse 16 so you understand his thought process and what he's going to say. Okay, He says, I repeat... Let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What, what I'm saying, with this both boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. Now what's happening here is Paul is having to lower himself to their thinking. Okay. Paul is understanding that these Judaizers have come in and they've sowed confusion amongst the uh, Corinthian church. And these guys were very arrogant, very cocky. Look at me. I speak well. I look well. I'm, I'm, I'm what you need to follow. And so Paul, having to step down from where he understands that he is the lowest of the low, he steps down to these Judaizer level and he says, hey, look, let's compare our resumes. Okay. He says, I don't, I don't do this to float my boat. I do it as a fool. Since many boast, boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrew? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near to death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Okay, and he continues on. Uh, any of you had a life kind of similar to Paul's? I got a lot of whippings. Never with a, a, a lash. There were... Did, did any of you guys ever have that stupid little game where you had a paddle, a rubber band, and a rubber ball, and you go, well, you're supposed to go, do, 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 do. I, you know, my parents used to buy those for us regularly. You know why? Because they knew that it wasn't going to take very long before the rubber band broke, and then they had a several months supply of paddles. Okay? Well, we graduated from paddles to wooden spoons. And then mom started running low on spoons, so she had enough of it. So she went out to the garage and she got 
uh, a one by four and she cut a handle into it. <laughs> my mom was not one of those who said, you just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> my mom took matters into her own hands. And then she would tell dad when he got home. Uh, but I was never beaten like Paul was. My brother Todd and I were 15 months apart. Um, we, we got into a lot of trouble. Mostly because of him. <laughs> well, he made it sound like such a good idea. Uh, one day we were going to play swords and we didn't uh, have decent sticks so we went downstairs to our closets we pulled all the clothes out of our closet and we took the dowels <laughs> and my dad came home from work to see my brother and I he was actually chasing me at that point because I smashed his thumb one too many times and uh, he, he was I think he was going to beat me with the rock thank goodness dad got home and I only got it with the paddle um, but I've, I've never suffered like Paul did. I, I never had to face. You know, I was on a ship, and I wasn't certain that we weren't going to have a ship wreck. Um, at that point, I probably would have been grateful for it. Um, but I, I, I don't live in danger. I don't. You don't. Uh, the, the extent of our danger is someone may shun us. Someone may say uh, harsh things to us. But, but this, is, this, this is Paul's testimony. And he says, I want to boast about my weakness because it's in my weakness that he is made strong. And, and this is the same writer that said, rejoice in everything. And you know how I know that, that he actually lived that out? Because remember when, when he and Silas were beaten and they were put in the cell? What did they do? They sang. They sang. Man, they were singing. And... and it had to be something that was markedly different because it was significant enough that they wrote about it in the book of Acts. So, two points that I just want to make today. The first one, saturate yourself with the word. Yeah. Um, you can start off small little dropper but if you don't let the spirit lead you and reveal to you in the word the things that God wants you to know it's not going to be very long until you're going to upgrade um, and you're I mean you're going to be fire hose saturated with the word so part of this is uh, I'm going to put up memory verses okay um, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably do two a month, give or take, uh, kind of ease into this memorizing thing. Um, the other thing is, I want us to live a life that reflects what God has done for us by being a people that are always giving praise in any and every circumstance. Because, uh, you know, Solomon was a smart fella. And he laid out, man, there's a time and a season for everything. For every up, there's going to be a down. And sometimes for every up, there's going to be a lot of downs. Okay? But we have the victory because we have a hope that is certain and sure.